So last night, I had this dream. I was walking in the mall by myself and just kind of angry and sad, aware of all the unkind things people have ever said or done to me and things I've done or said to others. I felt like a, a rain cloud about to burst. No, it was really weird because there were all these, these sheep, you know, like, Bah, sheep running everywhere. And what's weirder is that everyone was just going about their business as if this was normal. Then this man came up to me. Though I'd never seen him before, he reminded me of someone. He looked in my eyes with such a love, a joy. All those thoughts I'd been thinking, well, they just evaporated, just like that. So this man looked down at the cross around my neck, the one my grandma gave me for my first communion. In fact, he stared at it, and his eyes seemed to grow heavy, he even missed it up, as if it reminded him of something very painful. eyes returned to mine and he simply asked, what does it mean to you? Ellie! Ellie! Lamas of Denny! I couldn't really answer because I never really thought about it, at least not with any real meaning. But his very presence somehow gave it a meaning. Whatever was in his heart had something to do with what I was wearing around my neck. I looked down at my cross. I had to know. And then, in a way that often happens in dreams, I was walking again through the mall among the sheep with the same wonder, but became aware of all those around me doing all the things people do in malls, carrying packages, playing with their devices, drinking their beverages, and I couldn't help but notice each of them was also wearing a kind of cross. Some of them were stylish, others were artsy. A few were crucifixes. For each person, I could hear the man's words echoing. What does it mean to you? It didn't seem any of them heard or were even listening. They were too busy. But somehow, I was aware that each of them were carrying the weight I had been carrying like a rain cloud about to burst. And those packages they were clinging to, they were the price they paid. They kept paying, hoping to be freed of their weight. The man invited me to meet with him for real this Sunday at Mass. He said it would all make sense. And he told me to share this with as many people as I could. So if you could probably share a little bit about what we just saw. So the video that was up, it's actually an oldie, but hopefully a goodie. That's our daughter, Grace, who's now a senior. Um, but it is from the Live It Gathering Guide, which you can find at ilovemyfamily.us, which most of you know and hopefully have been blessed by. Um, it's just a uh, tool, if you will, to help families or groups gather together to talk and pray uh, based upon the upcoming Sunday readings. So we are in the last week of Lent. That's crazy too, to think about next week is the last full week of Lent. I should say next week is Holy week, which that too is crazy to think about. So um, that video, which is always part of the live it gather gathering guide, a video kind of um, 
telling a story or a main point about the upcoming gospel um, is for next week's gospel. So that's what that is about. Again, it's a great guide to help families come together to talk and to pray and to um, prepare for mass together. And um, at, again, you can find it at ilovemyfamily.us. So we still and continue to warmly welcome you back to our sixth week together as we are journeying more deeply into the Trinity which has been a real grace-filled uh, mm. time thus far. So Trinity, the first week we spoke on truth. The second week um, was uh, Father, um, Father Nathan for response, a response to that truth. The third week we were blessed with Melody Lyons, who spoke of incarnation, um, the N, natural with Peter and Debbie Herbeck. And last week we were so blessed with Father Nick Rao um, for the eye of Trinity of intentional. Tonight. Yes. Go ahead. Drum roll. Well, drum roll tonight. We're blessed to have the Alexanders, Greg and Julie Alexander. But before we introduce them more formally, blessed to have the drolls with us leading us in our opening prayer. So let us begin in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Lord Jesus Christ, together we proclaim that you are love itself. Mm. We acknowledge that your love holds us in existence. We proclaim that our marital relationship is the very fabric of your love. Today, again, we receive the powerful grace flowing from our sacramental marriage, flowing from your very heart while you were dying on the cross. Lord Jesus Christ, together with confidence, we bring to you every struggle, difficulty, and challenge. We recognize in these your hand molding us for sainthood, the opportunity to sacrificially pour ourselves out for the good of one another, always, without counting the cost, without reservation, that we might become like you. Lord Jesus Christ, together we recognize that our marriage and family is the primary target of Satan, adversary. In your name, we renounce all his lies and whispers that in any way has held or holds us captive, that in any way has influence. Right now, in your holy name, the name of Jesus, through the powerful intercession of our blessed Mother Mary, who crushes his head, we break his chains definitively, completely. Lord Jesus Christ, together in this very moment, we humbly avail our souls anew to you, in this very moment, we pray that you flood us with an abundance of your holy presence, that the authenticity of our faith will constantly shine through ready forgiveness, apology, and pursuit of your magnanimous love. Lord Jesus Christ, together we thank you for the amazing gift you give us in one another, in every way, the opportunity to attain holiness, to become what we are in you, to become saints. Today, again, we reclaim and declare our marital identity and mission to make you, who are love, known. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, uh, and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. So with all of the tumult in the world around us, we hearken back to those very poignant and powerful words of St. Teresa of Calcutta, because our hearts are all moved as parents here to make an impact for the kingdom. We want to change the world, right? The Disney thing last week, right? Who's canceled their Disney plus account. We haven't yet, but we're going to, um, the, uh, thing down in Florida with regard to sex education and, uh, heaven forbid that we prohibit the teaching outside of our homes up to age third grade and a lot of things happening. And we know at the core of this are all human beings destined for glory with God, destined to more fully know him. We know that hurting people hurt people and healing people heal people that at the heart of this tumult is a need for people to know Jesus Christ fully. And as we're entering into this Holy Week, we just leave us with this sense of pash, paschal mystery to cross over. So it's appropriate that tonight we have this, this word that describes, if you will, the pash, the passing over, which is transformation. And uh, so delighted that we have a couple who has a phenomenal transformational story 
I mean, this is going to be difficult for them. I mean, the bar is pretty high here because they've got hours and hours of phenomenal content to, to speak to our hearts with, and they've got 25 minutes to do it. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully this is going to ignite an open door for us to be attuned to the Alexander House, the amazing Alexander House, which we're all going to visit. We're going to go on a pilgrimage down to the Alexander. We're going to rock this place out. We're going to claim the city. We're going to join them in claiming the city, be a city on the hill and reverberate throughout the world. I'm just feeling it right now. All right. Alexander House. Uh, did I stop sharing? No, I didn't. All right. So we see this a couple storyboards here. Go to the alexanderhouse.com. Right up the home homepage, you will see the Alexander House offering hope and healing for marriage and relationships. They've been featured on a number of very prominent channels, not the least of which EWTN, Augusta Institute, Ave Maria Radio, and Franciscan Media. I might just offer this little tag to set it up. Greg and Julie, uh, your marriage, this is from their podcast they've had many media i think this is the one that's current though um your marriage disciples greg and julie your marriage disciples is a weekly program hosted by greg and julie to answer questions offer hope and give practical advice for a successful marriage the alexanders are authors of marriage 911 how god saved our marriage and can save yours too and 40 days of growing in love through prayer they have a passion for helping couples be the best they can be by utilizing a culmination of church teaching coupled with their own marriage and family experience and present it in a fun and energizing way they've been married for 33 years Longer. Boy, that's a great number. Probably now. I don't know if you guys have updated that, but 33 years of Christ. That's amazing. And have seven beautiful children. Another awesome number. Sacramental. Come on. Amazing. <laughs> Four grandsons and a granddaughter due in July 2020. So I guess this is probably now 35 years, but that's great. Bonus. We're, we're going for extra credit here. So <laughs> with no further ado, we are very delighted to welcome you, Greg and Julie Alexander. This hey, is thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Yes. I, I did unmute it. Okay. Yes, I did. <laughs> no, thank Thank you guys for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for the invitation for us to be here this evening. Uh, as you have read, we, we have a, a joy whenever we have an opportunity to kind of share and talk about the beautiful sacrament of marriage. However, before I, I jump into the presentation, we'll share with you a quick story. And this story is about a diocese who had recently installed a new bishop. That his incoming bishop had a sincere care and concern about Catholic education, so much so that he made the decision to visit the local Catholic high school to see what it was that the kids were learning in regards to their Catholic faith. So he shows up specifically to the sacraments class, introduces himself as a new bishop and his reason for being there. And he said, you know, I'm here to ascertain what it is that you guys have been learning in regards to your Catholic faith. And so to do that, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions. First question, who can give me the scriptural support for the sacrament of the Eucharist? A little girl in the front of the room immediately raised her hand. I know, Bishop, I know. He said, well, give it a shot. She said, Bishop, you can find that in John 6. When Christ says to his apostles that if you eat my body and drink my blood, you remain in me and I in you. Bishop said, outstanding, great job. Well, next question, who can give me the scriptural support for the sacrament of reconciliation? Little guy raised his hand. He immediately sounded off and said, Bishop, you can find that in John 20. This is when Christ said to his apostles that whatever sins you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever sins you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, the bishop said, I acknowledged and said, wow, great job. He said, man, you guys are pretty sharp. It's clear to me that you are part on in regards to learning your faith. However, one more question before I go. Who can give me the spiritual support for the sacrament of marriage? All the kids began looking around the room with these blank stares on their face. And all of a sudden, very timidly, a little guy began to raise his hand. And Bishop said, well, you think you know? And he said, well, I think so, Bishop. He said, go ahead and give it a shot. He said, Bishop, I can't tell you exactly where it says this in Scripture, but I believe it's the part where it says, forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they do. <laughs> 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 you know, it's great. Hey, thank you very much, Cheryl. <laughs> it's good that we can find a lot of humor in that particular joke, but it's also very sad and unfortunate because there are many of us today who are indeed living in sacraments of marriage, not having any idea why God created it in the first place. Now, the last thing I want you to think of is Julie and I is this perfect, wonderful, holy couple who's going to sit here tonight and, and kind of speak to the sacrament of marriage because we're not always that smart either. In fact, after 10 years of marriage, we had concluded that we had reached a point 
where we had to get a divorce. Um, I characterize it by saying we had begun to buy into the lies and the ways of the world, if you will. Uh, for me growing up, I was always taught that in, in order to be happy, in order to be successful, in order to be somebody, it was all about what you did for a living, how much money you made, and more importantly, what you did with that money. And I want to say by the world's standards, we were very successful, but unfortunately, you had to sacrifice for our marriage and family life. Uh, let me back up a second. Let me give you an idea where I come from. Born and reared in Houston, Texas. My parents converted to the Catholic faith when I was in the third grade. And much like many young men growing up in the church, uh, my brothers and I became altar boys. And we served the, the altar for years. And, and it was indeed, I would say, my first introduction to my Catholic faith. But I never really learned how to really embrace that, internalize and make that a lived experience. I took that same mentality on with me to middle school and high school and ultimately college, which is where Julie and I met, uh, 1984, St. Edwards University, Austin, Texas. And uh, it was pretty awesome because a week before we were due to school for her freshman year, freshman orientation, uh, I ran into a good friend of mine from high school, Joanna. And Joanna was all excited about the fact that going to St. Edwards University herself and towards the end of the conversation, she expressed the fact that when we get to school, she wants, wanted to introduced me to her roommate. They had been corresponding over the summer, had exchanged pictures. She said, Greg, I have to tell you, she's a very beautiful girl. And for some reason, I, I think you guys are hit it off. Well, fast forward a week later, uh, as they're having this back to school reception in the cafeteria, I walk in the cafeteria, I immediately noticed Joanna. So we started talking and she was expressing her excitement about, you know, her classes she had signed up for, meeting her, her all these new friends, getting her dorm room settled and everything else. But I just kind of interrupted. I said, hey, Everything, all that is fine and everything. I said, but what's up with that roommate? Where is she? She's all relaxed. She'll be here shortly. So as Joanna and I were engaging in conversation, the whole right side of the cafeteria is just plate glass windows. And from the corner of my eye, I saw this dark tan blonde walking up the sidewalk. And my thought was that would be pretty cool if that was her roommate. And she walked around and sure enough, it was. In fact, Joanna waved her with Julie, Julie, come here. And I immediately broke out into this cold sweat. And uh, well, I think many of you guys especially know exactly what I'm talking about, right? That first time you cast your eye on the beloved. <laughs> in fact, it, it reminds me of this, in the book of Genesis, in the creation story, when God created Eve. And um, well, you know the story. God put out of sleep, removed the rib, and created a woman. And I can always imagine just Adam kind of waking up from this deep sleep. And from the distance, he begins to see the contour of his body. And he's thinking to himself, whoa, man. And as he wipes the sleep from his eyes, the vision gets a little clearer. He's like, whoa, man. And there he is, dead, face to face, toe to toe, just captivated by her beauty. And again, whoa, man woman. And that, my brothers and sisters, is how woman got her name due to Adam's excitement when he saw her for the first time. <laughs> but again, I have to ask you, um, when was the last time you gazed into the eyes of your beloved and you maintained the same sense of awe and wonderment that you had when you saw each other for the first time? When was the last time you've done that? You know, again, our marriage starts off that way, but unfortunately, many times we allow life and kids and job and everything else to get thrown into the mix and kind of take us away from that beauty that started in a relationship in the beginning. And again, it's exactly where Julie and I were. But let me finish up the story right quick. So long story short, um, I proposed to her. We got married, graduated from college, uh, joined the United States Army. Uh, my first duty station was Fort Bragg, North Carolina. There we moved with uh, no friends and no family, all we had was each other in this newly marriage. And I would say we, we focused on each other pretty good because 10 months later, we welcomed my first child into our marriage relationship, Christopher. But after 11 months of Fort Bragg, I got a stateside transfer to Fitzsimmons Army Medical Center in Denver, Colorado. And this was a pretty cool time in our life because one, it's where Jude was from. Two, it gave me an opportunity to really spend a lot of time with her family. Now, her father specifically uh, spent three years in a seminary. And even though he didn't go on to become a priest, he maintained the qualities and characteristics of an awesome priest, always talking about the faith and how it should be an integral part of our lives and all those different things. And even though we had those great and wonderful conversations, I never really learned how to, again, incorporate that 
in my everyday life. Uh, three and a half years in Colorado, I got out of the service, we moved back to Austin, Texas, and I got a job in pharmaceutical sales. And this is where I like to say the problems begin to enter into our marriage. I've been married at that point for a little over four years, but again, all of a sudden this job provided the money that allowed us to be able to indulge and to acquire all of those things we had dreamed about in the early years of our marriage. In fact, we used to keep what we call a dream book and it had pictures of the kind of house we wanted, the kind of vehicles we wanted to drive, the vacation spots we wanted to travel to and all those different things. But again, this job allowed us to be able to acquire a lot of those things that we thought was going to make us successful but more importantly, we thought it was going to make us happy. And as you know, those things don't bring a long-term happiness. Maybe a little bit of excitement when you acquire them at first, but all of a sudden it begins to fade. It was on to the next car or the next trip or the next toy, whatever it was. And unfortunately, after a while, we reached a point where we can no longer find that happiness in other things. And we both started looking for that happiness in other people. And uh, needless to say, when, when those secrets were discovered, we just simply concluded that if we're having to resort to this kind of behavior, then maybe we need to get a divorce. Yeah, I'll take you back as Greg did. Growing up in a very devout Catholic family, um, going to mass on Sundays was not an option in my home. <laughs> I mean, you went no matter what. And yet I never really understood the what's of my faith. I mean, everything I did, I did because it's what your parents told you to do. And I, I never understood the relationship with God. Um, and I took that mentality on with me into high school and even, even into college um, and to our married life. Um, it is just, it's just incredible how our, our whole life re resumed around, like Greg said earlier, those things, that stuff, because it was that, that spinning wheel that we thought, you know, when we get the big, bigger house on the lake, then we'll be happy. When we get the nicer car, when we take one more trip, then we'll be happy. Um, it's just incredible because when we came together and we met, it's like I had this inside of me, this desire and knowledge to know that I just, I wanted to be married. I wanted to find a man who, who was going to love me and take care of me, but I didn't understand my own self-worth, my own dignity, any of that stuff. Um, and so the mentality that I took with me, even into our married life, I mean, I would get Greg out of bed when the alarm went off and get the kids ready for church. And we'd get there, we'd make it to mass. And it was like, phew, okay, we made it. And my only reason for going, phew, is because I knew if we didn't go, my mom and dad in Denver, Colorado would find out we didn't go to church. <laughs> so I didn't understand. I didn't realize the depths and the awesomeness that where Jesus Christ or God or the faith needed to be a part. And um, when we were first dating, um, we, when we were first married, we hung out with five couples. And in this group of couples, every one of the women were very career minded. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we would have gatherings, every parties get togethers. And every time we'd get together, I would hear them across the room and they'd share the, the job that they had and the money they were making, the promotions they got, the places they got to fly to, all those things. And they would come around to me and their demeanor would change and their tone of voice would change. And they'd be like, are you still staying home with your kids? I mean, do you really get anything out of that? Well, I didn't understand the importance or the necessity or the awesomeness of that. So I started to go, well, you know what? No, I don't get thanked very much. It's the most thankless job there is. It's the hardest job and you don't get paid for it. I get thanked now, <laughs> but, but it's one of those things that I didn't understand. I didn't get it. So I was going to compete with these people. And I was going to prove to them that not only can I get a job outside the home, but I was going to get, I was going to make more money than any of them because all of these people were very successful. So I got a job outside the home and it was in a very prestigious health club. And I started to make serious money. I started to make more money than I ever thought I'd make in my life. Then I started to hang out with the people that worked out there. So a day in the life of Julie was waking up at 4 30 AM to go work out, come home, get the kids ready for daycare, put them in daycare. So I could go to work because I had to make more sales. Cause I had to remain number one salesperson, do all these things that made me feel good and prove my worth and go get the kids at daycare. Right. When it closed, come put them back in daycare until we close down and get the kids ready, go to bed at 930 to get up and do it the next day. 
it just was a relentless wheel of, of burning out. But at that time, we thought it was the best thing to do. And it was really cool because we were hanging out with those people. Long story short is um, I accepted a job in San Antonio, Texas, because someone told me I could make more money than I was making now. And I took it and everybody just goes, wow. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it's an hour and a half drive south, an hour and a half drive back home. But I was making some tons of money and I thought that was worth it. Well, I got a little tiresome driving back and forth. So I decided to live in San Antonio and go home on Wednesdays and on the weekends to visit with Greg and the kids. Well, I get home on Wednesday and I'm greeted at the door and Greg opens the door and he said, you know, I am tired. I said, I am too. I can't wait to go to bed in my own home. He said, no, you don't understand. I'm emotionally tired. I'm done. I think we need to get a divorce. And immediately I agreed. I mean, we, you know, we had house together. We had children in common. We even had joint checking accounts, which was huge for us, but we had nothing else. We were spiritually divorced. He would come downstairs. I'd go upstairs. He'd come upstairs. I'd go out or I'd go downstairs and go outside. It was like this total trying to avoid one another, trying not to even, you know, ruffle feathers or whatever. But I can remember the moment that I really thought about what he asked. And he said, when he said, I want to get a divorce, I remember thinking my parents would kill me. What am I going to do? I had this panic. So I walked, I went up the stairs and I called our parish priest, a 911 call to our parish priest. And I said, Father, we're in trouble. We need to come see you tomorrow. He let us in the next day. He had an appointment available and we got into his office and he said, Hey, Greg and Julie, come in. What's going on? We said, Father, we are in trouble. We're going to get a divorce. What are you going to do about it? He said, what am I going to do about it? We're like, yes, you, you, we get married in the church. You, you get, marry us. What are we going to do? We don't know what to do. He said, I don't know what to do for you. Do you want this marriage to work? We said, this marriage? Are you kidding? No. He said, I can't help you. But here's a card to a Catholic Christian counselor. So we called, made an appointment with this counselor, which basically we got a $100 history lesson as to how our marriage was like the Civil War. Greg, you're always going to be like the North. Julie, you're always going to be like the South. And, you know, sometimes you're going to have to understand that never, maybe you were never really meant to be together. Oh, that'll be a hundred dollars and make an appointment for in two weeks for like, for what? So we went home and we did what we thought was the smart thing to do. And we called our seven and nine year old into the room when we got home and we said, guys, mom and dads are going to get it. Mom and dad are going to get a divorce. And regardless of the fact that they were huddled in the corner, literally their bodies were shaken. They were holding each other and crying profusely and how sad it is that we could look at them and say, Oh, that'll be fine. You know, Bob and Sue down the street, they, they got a divorce and their kids, they send their kids to counseling. We'll just do the same thing. How cold hearted we had become, but there was an amazing grace and a gift and a miracle that happened is that during the summer, it became uh, our, our parish priest went out of town for the summer to, to do continuing education. And there was a priest that filled in for the entire summer. And he was such a teacher of the faith. Our hearts were on fire. We couldn't wait to go the next day. We got up early. We sat in the front. We couldn't wait to get to know who this guy was. Well, we had, we hung out in between the mass times and we found out he was the tribunal vicar for the diocese. <laughs> we knew nothing about our faith, but we knew this was the guy that does that a moment thing. And God is being so generous to us that maybe he's here to help us get out of our marriage. <laughs> and so <laughs> we made an appointment to go visit with him. He thought we were coming by for a social visit. And as we sat there and threw up everything on his desk, he's done this. She's done this. It was actually a tennis match back and forth. He sat back so patiently and said, you know, I understand your plight and your situation, but let me ask you a few questions. What's God's plan for marriage? Who? <laughs> we don't know. What does our church teach about the sacrament of marriage? I don't know. What are some of the writings of St. Paul and the various Holy Fathers dealing with marriage? We're like, Father, we don't know. What does this have to do with us? We were once in love and now we're not. We were just hoping you could help us get out of this. He said, ah, but before you go any further, I suggest you go home and find the answer to these questions that I asked you. And thanks be to God, Greg did. 
And so not only did I have to go home and find the Bible first, but I had to dust it off before I could read it because we had never asked that scripture before. But I remember every year we heard this great homily about St. Paul and Ephesians. So I thought, well, let me go to Ephesians and see what Paul had to say. And I found my way there to chapter five, I think it's verse 22. But I remember opening it up and it's almost as if those words jumped out in bold print. And I read wives be submissive to your husbands <laughs> and i remember thinking to myself here's the problem in our marriage relationship i got miss fitness queen over here want to want to make a million dollars she's just simply not doing the things that i want her to do in this marriage and so needless to say i found this newfound bible would be some pretty cool stuff right so i thought well let me go back and let me read some more so i can arm myself with some ammunition and be ready for her when she got home that evening so but i went back and continued to read and and the next few lines i read were husbands love your wives like christ loved the church and i remember thinking to myself man like christ loved the church christ died for the church am i dying to myself for something that she is wanting and desiring in our marriage and unfortunately the answer was no but for the first time and it really began to dawn on me that that maybe some of my own selfishness was contributing to the breakup and demise of our marriage and then I found my way on the internet and uh, found out about these little things called encyclicals. I never heard of it. But the first one I downloaded and read was St. John Paul the Great's Familiaris Consortium. And if you never read that document, I would highly ask that you get your hands on it because it began to, to teach to me the many attacks that the world would wage on a marriage relationship. But I also learned what constituted a good Christian husband, a good Christian father, and some of the dynamics that should take place in the home in order for this home to become a domestic church. And thanks be to God for my in-laws who gave us a catechism of the Catholic Church as a wedding gift, or we wouldn't have had one in the house. But I went there to see what, what this church had to say about marriage. And I found myself, uh, found my way to Article 7, I think paragraph 1601, 1602, Marriage and God's Plan. And there were those words again. And, and literally for the next two days, I just stayed at home and just reading, accessing and consuming this information and just taking these notes. And on the second day, I called Julie into the room. I said, Julie, I said, come here. I said, let me share with you what our church has to teach about marriage. In all honesty, I looked at it and I said, no wonder we're messing it up. We're not even coming close to living like this. Look at this stuff. And one section of the paragraph, uh, one paragraph in this section of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it talked about what would happen to your marriage relationship once you allow the regime of sin to come into it. I believe it's paragraph 1606. But it began to talk about hatred, domination, lust, infidelity, all of those things that we were experiencing. And then I began to think that, wow, that if this church knows something about the difficulties we can encounter, maybe we can find some answers here as well. And so I started sharing some of those answers with Julie that I was finding. And what I was finding in her is that she was just as much in awe as I was. In fact, she turned to me, she said, this is incredible. What do we do? And, and instinctively I turned to her and said, maybe we need to pray. And again, at this point, we had been together for 13 years, 10 years married, and not one time had we ever come together to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Uh, outside of a meal prayer or the Our Father, but the two of us had never come together in prayer. So I took her by the hand, we got on our knees, and I recited a simple prayer. I said, Heavenly Father, we try living our marriage based upon the things that we think we should do. It doesn't work. We've also tried living by the ways of the world, and that too doesn't work. And I said, Heavenly Father, more than anything in the world, right here, right now, we sincerely invite you into our lives to show us how you want us to live marriage. And if you deliver us from this evil, we will commit the rest of our lives in working in some kind of marriage or family ministry. Well, you know the old saying, be careful what you pray for, right? <laughs> so God went to work, and, and as we began to literally feel his grace in our lives, the very next week, we both went in and resigned from our corporate jobs because we had really come to understand that the jobs provided the money that allowed us to indulge in all of those things that, that not only took us from each other, but now as we had come to understand, that took us away from our Heavenly Father as well. And, and then we felt called to create an apostolate to begin to help other couples come to understand what we had learned. Because so we simply started asking our fellow friends and parishioners the same questions this good priest asked us. Do you know anything about God's plan for marriage? Uh, what is a sacramental marriage? Uh, what are our responsibilities to our children in, in regards to allowing them to grow up in this domestic church? And we started getting a deer in the head like re response from everybody else. So we started doing these workshops and, um, 
to you right quick. We did just start doing the workshops. Julie uh, got a call from uh, DRE from another parish. She heard about some little talks we were doing in our parish. And uh, she asked Julie if we had a workshop. Well, a beautiful bride lied. Yes, she lied. And uh, committed us to a workshop that we didn't even have. She came to me, sweetheart, sweetheart. We have our first workshop on behalf of Alexander House. I'm like, what are you talking about? We, we don't even have a workshop. She said, well, we got a date. You better come up with something. So we went back and, and started to create what we now call the six essential elements for a strong Catholic marriage and started presenting the workshops. And the workshops were going great. But yet couples were coming up and said, wow, we've learned a lot here today, but we need more individual attention. Do you work with couples individually? So I took so a page from her book and said, <laughs> yes, we work with couples individually. And that began now what we call today our Marriage Disciples Program. And in the last 23 years, Julie and I and myself personally have worked with over 5,000 couples in that process, 90% of which coming to us as we were on the brink of divorce. And I'm happy to report that today we have been able to, to help Re reconcile and to salvage uh, all of those marriages with the exception of 37. And I don't think I have to tell you, it has nothing to do with Greg and Julie, but it has everything to do with the couples and their willingness to engage and to come together, coupled with God's grace that has allowed us to witness so many wonderful marriage, uh, uh, miracles. miracles. And um, I know we're running short on time, Julie's waving the clock here, but I'll, I'll leave you with this specifically. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people who come into marriage to get married in the Catholic Church, and they know that they have created the sacrament, if you will. And uh, based on the, the Baltimore Catechism's definition of a sacrament, an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. So we're under the misconception that if we're married in the church, we now have a sacrament that all the grace should be there. And everything should be great and wonderful. For if they are not, maybe there's something wrong with marriage. God forbid, maybe there's something wrong with the other person. Or we get a lot of the educated Catholics, I call them now, who come and say, well, maybe we just don't have a valid sacramental marriage. And, and none of that is true. The problem is, is that we don't know and understand God's plan for marriage. And if we don't know his plan for marriage, we can't live it out to the way that he has prescribed us to. And if we don't live it out, we are not made available to the full abundance of grace in that sacrament. Yes, the grace is indeed there. And it's no different as if I had a million dollars in the bank, and I got a stack of bills on the table. Well, those bills can't get paid until I write the checks to withdraw the funds from that bank account. And so the grace of the sacrament is there, but until we do the things that God calls us to do in marriage, in essence, withdraw the grace from the marriage, then and only then can we experience that full abundance of grace. So it behooves us to continue to learn and study, and our church is, is full of resources to really give us that understanding. And if you don't want to take the time to do that, just come see us in the Marriage Disciples program, and we'll take you through that process. Amen. And the last thing I say, I love the fact that we got transformational because the transformation came with us, him being the man and leading me to God getting a, getting on his knees and asking me to get on my knees. And literally I said, saying a deliverance prayer, but deliver us from this evil. I mean, it's like we were, we were just wrapped around the ways of the world. And now this is all we do full time in what God has done. He literally has transformed our hearts. And we love that the scripture verse that created me and clean heart. Oh God. Mm. And, and is that's what he's done. God has transformed us. And so it's those, what we always say with Henry now and the wounded healers, we were so wounded and mm -hmm. so messed up because we were doing it on our own, our own accord, selfishness. And when we surrendered that day through that prayer, we allowed God to come in and transformed our hearts, which transformed our marriage and our family. And it's, we we're being more blown away. Our daily parent blessing. Again, we encourage you to pray this and even more to be an ambassador, if you will, of bringing it to your parish and distributing it. We'd love to get, send a hundred cards your way. Um, just contact us or find out more on massimpact.us prayer card. Um, but let's just conclude with this. Actually, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to conclude with this prayer. And then I'm going to put Greg and Julie on the spot since we're all gathered here to just as the Lord guides you, Greg and Julie, to pray um, as the Spirit leads you to bless us all in this gathering. We'll end the formal part. If those who want to go, can go and we'll continue. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ. Let your holy anointing be upon each of our children, grandchildren, and godchildren this day. 
take a moment and let the Holy Spirit put their faces and names in our hearts. In your sacred name, we claim them for you. We renounce all whispers, lies, and influences of the enemy. We pray right now that each know your loving presence, be forged in virtue, and be flooded with an abundance of your Holy Spirit to live fully their identity and mission in you now and through all eternity. Amen. Greg and Julie. All right. Heavenly Father, most gracious God, Father, we love you and we praise you and we give you thanks. And Father, there, there's so many things that we give you thanks for. First of all, just the mere fact that you allowed us all to wake up this morning and to share and have this day in your kingdom. Father, we give you thanks for the beautiful gift of marriage and the gift that you have given us in each other. And Father, as you know, there's many times in which we fall short of who and what it is that you call us to be. And for those times, we humbly ask you for your forgiveness. But more importantly, Father, we ask you for your grace to plant a hunger and a thirst in our hearts to have you front and center in our marriage, to be able to, to tap into the many resources you have in this beautiful church to come to understand what is your plan, what is your design for marriage, mm -hmm so that we may experience the joy and happiness that you've intended, but also be a beacon of light for all those in the world to see mm -hmm. through us what your love looks like. And Father, just uh, in a particular way, just uh, thanks and blessings for all the couples who are able to be here this evening, for those who are not able to be here. And Father, as we know that there is this evil entity out there looking to destroy this beautiful sacrament mm -hmm. because we reflect your love. Father, we ask for your hedge of protection to be placed over and around in all of us. If, in fact, Father, we ask that that hedge be expanded in a 5,000 mile radius in all directions and fortified through the holy angels of war, mm -hmm. a guardian angels, St. Michael the Archangel, angel and saint joseph terror of demon fathers mm. cast out any evil element that may be lurking in our lives in our marriages in our homes and that it be cast out and placed at the foot of the cross for our lord and savior jesus christ to do with as he wills and father in all this we ask through the immaculate heart of our blessed mother mary and in the sacred heart in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Greg and Julie. Stick around, all the rest of you. We enter into Holy Week, and we are so delighted to be on this journey. The sixth stop, we conclude, or I should say we continue uh, through the final one next week. So God bless you, but stay along as long, stay around as long as you want. You're not rude for cutting out, and uh, we'll yeah. leave it with that. Questions or comments? Well, I have a first one, just to get us going. So... We listed like nine things that were hinges for us, critical for each of us to really go deeper in our marriages. But I think one big thing, I want to just ask it this way, Greg and Julie, what have you learned about the use, and I might say the gift and blessing of the tongue over your marriage years? What have you learned about how critical it is to have inner self-mastery and also to the degree to which we communicate to one another. How's it, how have you gone from more, more curse to more blessing and that sort of thing? What yeah. advice do you give? The, the day that I read the scripture that brought me to my knees literally, and I was sweating when it said, you will be held accountable for every word you utter. Hmm. And all I could think about is, Oh my goodness, that I would, I pictured myself standing in front of God literally and him saying, okay, so what about this word? What about that? that how, how well did you speak to my son, Greg? It's like, Oh my gosh. And I had all these, like literally these thoughts in my head about, Oh, you saw him, God, you knew what he was like. You knew what he didn't do, mm -hmm. but it was one of those things. I said that the, our tongue has the power to kill or to edify and build up. Hmm. We recognized that when most of our marriage, we were silent. We didn't yell or scream, but it's those little digs. I come from a very sarcastic family because that's just what we do. And Greg didn't appreciate that, but I, it's fun. It's what I do. So he took it as a cut down and a, and a, a put down in front of other people. And I was making fun and I wasn't, but I didn't understand. It is critical. The, the tongue literally is, is the rudder for our marriage because it's how we use it that will put life into the other person or literally kill the spirit of the other person. Yeah. And I would say this a lot of times, uh, what really allows for the negativity to be 
utilized in words is when we get frustrated or anger or maybe even how we speak to each other. And, and with that, uh, maybe a practical tip is that we have people in that communication. Yes, be honest and open, but it's all about the delivery of what it is that you have to say. And so therefore speaking in that, that warm and charitable tone, that loving tone, because typically when we do that, it doesn't put the other person on defense. And, uh, and so as long as we kind of keep that in mind and, and watch how we, we offer those fraternal corrections or those words of admonishment, just doing it in a loving way to where it doesn't rub the other person the wrong way, put them on defense and have them kind of launch back. And, and that's, we see a lot of times with couples, that's kind of the source of, of many of the problems they have because none of us have really come from homes that have modeled the, the, the right way to communicate. Let me say that we bring into our own uh, communication styles, be good, bad, or indifferent. Ours is where we came from. So for us, it's good, but you get those two different styles in the home and we have to find a way to get on that same page. So honesty, charity, and empathy, honesty, always allowing the platform to exist where one or the other can come to the table and say, this is what I think, this is what I feel, and this is what I need. And really to listen to that. And when we listen, two ways to listen, listen to defend or listen to respond. Many of us, of course, in this competitive world have been uh, condition to listen and then jump in defense. In fact, even before the other person finishes, we're already shutting down and thinking of ways or words to refute or to re rebut what the other person has said. But we want to listen to what they're saying. And again, especially the bad things, because typically we're not complaining. We're just expressing our heart to allow the other person to know where they're at in the relationship. And so the appropriate, the loving response is to listen to that and to respond. Quick example, um, when Julie and I were coming back. Uh, there was a female that I grew up and I kind of dated in high school, but still maintained a relationship in our marriage. And so Julie came to me with a request. She said, look, if you want me to be in a good place as we move forward, I need you to cease all relationship with Karen. Now, I could have sat there and said, hey, why do I have to stop communicating with Karen? I mean, I've known Karen since I've long, known you. We're just friends. We don't even live in the same town. And I could have given all of these reasons as to why that relationship should exist. But I listened to her heart because what I heard was that relationship was posing a threat to her. And so my response was, it's a done deal. If me having a relationship with Karen makes you feel threatened in any way, I don't need it. In fact, I won't have to call Karen and let her know that there won't be a friendship. I'll cease all communication at this moment. So again, listening and then responding to the heart of the other person. Thank you for that. And I suspect we're all on the same page here to turn that course for maybe a culture that's more volatile and less control it does take right a self-awareness that requires repentance. I'm so sorry for this way. Pray for me. I struggle with this. Um, I want to be held accountable. I need to go vertical. I need to go to God and seek that grace. Um, I want to even like say for a week, um, I want to take note of the times that maybe I, as a, we're not victims, we're victorious in Christ, right? But where I accept more of a victim mentality versus victorious. So I'm just, anything else you might add to taking a step from maybe a more, a, a less honoring to a more honoring relational culture, communications culture. Yeah, it's so hard because we want to do a whole workshop right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, go ahead. No, I, I was gonna say I, I love the, the prayer piece oh. because uh, yeah. again, I, I don't think we give enough credence and understand the magnitude and the power of God's grace because it's everything. Everything that we are all the way able, able, capable of being and doing is hinged upon God and His grace. My speaking to you right now is God's grace at work. All of you, your, your, your ability to take your very next breath is God's grace at work because He wills it to be so. And, and when we came to understand that in this beautiful sacrament, there was grace that can be tapped into, uh, it, it also became the impetus for us to petition God for grace for other aspects of our relationship that we needed. And, and so, Greg, as you so eloquently stated, it's just going to God and petitioning Him for that grace that we need to speak in a loving, charitable way, to, to really be self-reflective of how the ways in which we might speak that causes hurt and harm to the other person. And uh, so, be beautiful. Yeah, and I love that you said that because of the volatile world that we live in and what we have been allowing couples to understand is there is a spirit in this world of division, of confrontation, mm -hmm. of me against you. I'm not going to pay attention. You're not going to all these things. 
and totally opposite of what Christ says, totally opposite of what we should be doing. Um, and so forgiveness, what you said is key every time, all the time. I'm so sorry. What just came out of my mouth shouldn't have, will you forgive me? I didn't intend to hurt you. Not only does it take a humble heart and a humble disposition, but we have to remember we're on the same team. And oftentimes we get almost everybody we know comes into marriage and we're so competitive that we think it's your, your side, my side, and who's going to win. Mm. Well, there's no such thing as one winner. Either we both win or we both lose. Mm. And so what we've recognized is every decision, every conversation we have starts with going to God in prayer and asking him to be a part and coming up with the same understanding and same conclusion where we are saying, no, I need you to listen to me and I'm right. And he's saying the same thing. We both want to do what God wants us to do. And we're on that level playing field. Then we, then we are on the same, we're supposed to be on the same team. So it's often, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions, comments, opportunity with the masters of marriage still yes. on the journey to eternity. Can One of those hard burning questions? questions. Go ahead, Hannah. Okay. Um, during your talk, you mentioned something about six pillars or something like that of a, um, of a Christian marriage. Can you just name them for us? Yes, real quick? Yeah, yes absolutely. Yeah. But we refer to them as the six essential elements for strong Catholic marriage. That's uh, understanding and living God's plan for marriage uh, and, and tapping to the sacramental aspect of it. God's plan for chastity in marriage, forgiveness and healing in marriage, coming and understanding, coming to know and understand what it means to be a servant spouse in a marriage relationship, communication, uh, and then weaving spirituality throughout that whole process. And so uh, those being those six foundational things and what we found, we've had couples that have come to us where there was minor communication issues all the way up to where not only infidelity, but children born from those infidelity uh, relationships. And in fact, five of those situations, not only did the spouses take the wayward spouse back, but they even went as far as to adopt the children of those illicit affairs. And so I'm sorry, but to, to, to see, to, they to, to change the clothes of the physical manifestation of your spouse's infidelity. That takes God in his grace to, to help us do that. And, and we, we witness those miracles. Those people come back together and adopting those kids as their own. And it's pretty powerful. And so those six essential elements are those things that God calls us to do in a, in a marriage relationship. And when we do what God asks us to do, therein lies the grace. However, when we turn our back and, and go away from what God wants to do and do what we want to do, by the way, it's the definition of sin. There's no grace. And so we have to come to understand is by participating fully in what God wants that makes us available to the full abundance of grace that this beautiful sacrament has. And those six essential elements is the foundation to begin that process. So I don't know if that would answer this question, Alexander's, but um, I wanted to just throw out the phrase marriage prep courses. Um, what do you see in the church today or what would you recommend best or from the couples that you've ministered to um, over all of these years? Uh, obviously, those six essentials, I'm sure, is what has come from them. But um, what would you say to priests? You know, how to I mean, you were, I'm sure, frustrated with in your story, the initial priest and then blessed by the, the fill in priest. So whatever you want to pick out of that rambling um, to bless us with, go for it. <laughs> uh, I guess what I like to hone in and really focus on is what does it mean to be that servant spouse? Again, in this society that we grow up and in, in condition to believe that life is about me as an individual, you know, where do you want to school? Where, where do you want to go to school? What do you want to study? Who do you want to marry? How many kids you want? Where do you want to live? It's you, 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 you. And yet to come in this relationship called marriage and I'm now supposed to die to myself, for this other person, are you kidding me? It just goes against the grain of everything that we've been conditioned to believe. Mm -hmm. However, when we really come to understand the role of what it means to be that, that certain spouse, and Christ said it best himself, I came to serve, not to be served. So he is the model for what that looks like. And, and especially during this time of Lent, uh, as we find Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, anxiety so high, sweating droplets of blood. And the reason being, because in his divinity, knowing full well what he was about to experience in the crown of thorns, the beating, scourging at the pillars, and ultimately the crucifixion. So therefore, the human side of him was like, Father, I don't want to go through this. Three times he cries out, if this cup can pass me, let it be. 
But ultimately, he submits to the will of the Father, and he goes to the cross because of his love for us. And I don't think I have to tell you that that probably didn't feel very good, which clearly demonstrates love has nothing to do with the feeling. It's a conscious decision, an act of the will to die to self for the sake of the beloved. And that dying to self looks like one of two things. It means either foregoing things that I want to do, but I'm going to forego these things for the sake of my beloved. And sometimes it means doing things that I don't know how to do, don't want to do, maybe never learn how to do, but I'm going to do it because it's what my beloved desires. Now, we'll add this disclaimer. In these uh, 23 years of working with couples, we we learn to say that as long as you're requesting, it's good, righteous, and moral. There mm-hmm. shouldn't be any reason as to why your spouse wouldn't be willing to do that. And so, again, as that is what God calls us to do, in doing so, dying to self for sake of the beloved, that's what unlocks the door for some of that grace that we need. And, and so, going away from that selfishness and understanding that true love is always dying to self and willing the greatest good for our beloved. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Because, you know, I got a whole list. I go all night. We're not going to go all night, but we want the easy ones. Keep on the easy ones. (laughs) Yeah. While we're waiting, just could you comment on what you've discovered about the importance of the hierarchy? And by that, I mean, God first, spouse second is a link, right? And then family third, world fourth. And if the top link is not there, the rest falls. Did you have to discover that? And how do you nurture it? How do you keep things in their proper order? Yeah, that was one of the first things that we really came to as we started getting back into the studies of our faith and the teachings of the church in regards to marriage is that we realized that we had that whole thing inverted. And Jobs refers the things that we accumulated as a result of the money from the jobs and then maybe the kids and then maybe us and God was on the bottom mm-hmm. when everything would fall apart and say, God, why are you, why are you cursing us like this? Why are you doing this to us? When little did we know that we were doing it to ourselves. So we had to go back and, and write that, that wrong, if you will, put God on top because God is the source of the grace for who and what we need to be for each other. So if he's not at the top, we can't give what we don't have because being in that number two position, receiving that grace, then we can be who and what we need to be for each other. Then spilling over to the kids and everything else uh, after that. In fact, it's the order that God created, as we see demonstrated many times when Christ was picking his apostles. And there were several times when they had excuses. Uh, my father died. The funeral tomorrow. I want to go to the funeral. But after the funeral, I will follow you. Christ says, no. Mm-hmm. And your mother, your brothers, sisters, no one can come before me. So God has to be that number one. And here's the beautiful thing too, Greg, is that in, in living that out is measured somewhat in, in maybe um, qualitative as opposed to quantitative. In other words, so if God is my number one, it doesn't mean that I got to be reading scripture all day, studying the catechism, tossing out these quotes is how I give time and attention to him. So as it is for you and I, when we first wake up in the morning, literally our hands meet in the middle of the bed and I start with a quick prayer. We have a, a morning offering as a prayer, if you want to recite that, but I used to recite from the heart. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for allowing us to wake this morning to share and have this day in your kingdom. Father, we ask you for your grace to demonstrate the very love of your son, Jesus Christ, in and through each other and anyone else that we come in contact with. Amen. Mm-hmm. Now, when I do that simple prayer, God is looking down from the heavens. He said, oh, wow, Greg and Julia are up this morning. Huh. Greg didn't go to the computer to check his email, nor did he go to ESPN to check the scores of the March Madness games last night. <laughs> he took his wife by the hand and he brought her to me in prayer. I must be pretty important to those guys. Mm-hmm. So again, it, it doesn't take a whole lot. A lot of times when we start working with couples, so you got to bring God in a relationship. They think that there's these insurmountable things that they have to accomplish all day, every day. It's just the simple things. And what we'll also find with each other as we transition to that number two position, it's the simplest things that we do for each other to allow the other person to know that they're critically important to us. Now we do reach into the world and the pop psychology world, if you will, and we grab hold of the emotional needs. Uh, um, William F. Harley would be a good uh, resource for that in terms of understanding that process, but we all have emotional needs, our emotions inside of us. Those emotions may be positive or negative, and what determines whether or not, whether they are positive or negative, is whether or not we get our emotional needs met. The God given needs. More importantly, God has given us each other as a means to minister to those needs. So that's kind of the first. Um, um, 
thing to accomplish as a servant spouse is making sure I minister to Julie's emotional needs every day because unbeknownst to many of us, and this is one of my frustrations with many of the marriage preparation courses, they never even broached this, this subject. And, and it's really the U-turn that we experience with couples when we teach them this part about what it is to go back to really come to understand the emotional needs of your spouse and what needs to be said and done on a daily basis to minister to those needs. And so, for example, it could be a quick phone call. Hey, Julie, I'm down here at the office, crazy busy. I got a five more appointments. I don't have a lot of time to talk, but I'm just calling to let you know that I'm thinking about you and I can't wait to get home to see you this evening. That 30 second phone call is going to make the night and day difference because I've just sewn into her and allow her to know I'm thinking about you. I love you. I can't wait to see you. And so when I get home, guess what? Home is going to be this beautiful haven for me to come home and relax in. But we see so many couples where not only are they not willing to do for the other person, but now they're expecting the things that you should be doing for me. And the beautiful thing in this mindset is that if we both die to self for the sake of the other person, we both get our needs met. It's just not getting met in a selfish way. I'm dying to myself for Julie. She's dying to herself for me and mission accomplished. And it's very critical. And I'm just going to say in Catholic connections, Catholic, Catholic groups, Catholic people, Catholic couples is because so often we forget to incorporate our part we have so many people that say, I go to adoration, I pray to God that he'll change. I go to daily mass and I go to the, and we're like, okay. And did you tell your husband that you love him? And you, no, I just pray to God that he'll change him. <laughs> so, and we have that often and we do. It's because we've had this, this personal, you know, private relationship, pray to God, go to mass, beautiful. But you go to get the grace. You go to be Jesus, to, to fill up so you can then be Jesus for the other. And it's not about us at all. It's not about, yeah, I go to daily mass because I go to daily mass. Well, I go to daily mass because I need the grace in order to love Greg the way that God calls me to, because I will be held accountable for that one day when I see God face to face. Fabulous. Very grateful for you. Any burning last questions? I, I've got too many that can be answered in this <laughs> sitting, which is really, truly blessed and grateful. We'll allow any burning question, last one, anybody wants to ask it or comment. I was just going to say, you guys have um, seven kids. How did you, and from a practical standpoint, balance your relationship in the thick of raising small children? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, you, you asked that question. Let me, let me jump back here. If we have time, I'll say this. Uh, at the 10 year mark, while on the brink of divorce, we had two kids and we only had two kids because after a second child was born, when I was in the military, uh, Julie had gone to her postpartum, uh, you know, mm -hmm. postpartum appointment and her OBGYN said, Hey, Greg and Julie, come on in guys. You got the perfect family. You have your son. Now you have a daughter and one of you guys need to get fixed. And we're like, fix doc. Isn't that something you do to animals? He said, well, let me explain to you the human version. So he went on to talk about Julie, uh, option to undergo a tubal or how I could undergo a vasectomy. And I simply concluded that wow, since she had all the pain and toil of bearing the children, I'll be the man and I'll get the vasectomy. And so that coupled with uh, ignorance of our faith and a whole lot of selfishness because we thought, wow, that second child, when she graduates from high school, we'll still be in our early 40s. We can travel, make money, do all these different things. Yeah, I'll do this. And so it wasn't until... Uh, Roughly 10 years later, as we're having this awakening in our faith, uh, actually starting reading Humana Vitae, then Theology of the Body, where I came to understand what I did was wrong. And long story short, prayerfully discerned to have that, that procedure reversed, not simply to have kids, but in my mind, I wanted to be put back the way that God created me. But as a result, he gifted us with five beautiful kids. So our oldest is 33, our youngest is 12. And, uh, and they are very much an integral part of what we're doing. Up until this last year, we homeschooled. And so they were always with us. They traveled with us. They worked at our, our merchandise tables. They sold books and everything else. But we always make sure we have that proper balance. And, and that's hard in this day and time because there's always something else, especially ministry work, always something else to do or to be accomplished. So we're, we're very intentional about having our time, our prayer time, our time with the family and, and our, our work life. And uh, so we, we seem to keep a pretty good balance. Yes. And I'll just be very honest. Like right now, we just, we just purchased 10 half acres and we have the Alexander house that you're all going to come down and see us in. <laughs> That's what I heard Greg say. But 
long story short is um, we've been saying no to all the outside invitations mm. because it was a statement that was told to us once that every time you say yes to something outside of your home, you're saying no to someone inside your home. Mm-hmm. And so it was very difficult, but it's now become such a blessing for us to say no, except for Greg and Stephanie. We said yes. <laughs> and we're just saying no because we we have we tell our children that God is first, but God and ministry aren't the same thing. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. But we used, we started it that way because it was all about, oh my gosh, God saved our marriage. And we went and ran and did all this stuff and, and did all these things. And then all of a sudden we're like, wait a minute, we have each other and our children that we need. I, I used to be a flight attendant. And it was that whole thing where when the oxygen mask comes down, put it on yourself first Mm. and help the one next to you. And I used to think that was horrible and rude until I got it. Cause if you pass out, you're no good. Mm-hmm. And so literally, and I say this to young couples, you guys are so cute. And thank you for being on, not you, Greg, <laughs> you guys are cute, too, so cute. <laughs> but not young and you're young too. <laughs> but that couple is so darling. I don't know your names, but you're young. You're asking the questions. It is so beautiful, but let me tell you, just be a family. In, in this world that we live in, and there's a lot of evangelization and all these things that you can do, but don't worry about going out and doing so much. Just be a domestic church and be simple and, and surround yourself with good, solid, Catholic, like, like-minded, Christ-believing people, couples, and just... Just take it easy because so many couples we see they're spending all their time separate at men's groups, women's groups, all these different things. And we've got to come back to building and and strengthening the domestic church. I just want to add right quick, we keep falling back and forth, but I was having a, a conversation with Father Wade Menezes, Fathers of Mercy priest, and he was, we were having that mm-hmm. conversation how there's so many times the laity are trying to live a life as if they are clergy or religious life. And he said, Greg, he said, couples fail to understand that it's in the washing the dishes and, and cutting the yard and bringing home the paycheck. That's how you sanctify your vocation. It's not being in mass all day. And he said, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with mass but not to the extent where it disrupts your, your family. He said, there's a reason why God only has one day of obligation during the week. And, and so again, I'm not saying that the other masses are not important, but uh, well, a couple we're working with right now, the guy gets up every morning, makes it to 6 a.m. mass, goes to work, and the wife, they have five kids at home, so it's always up to her to get the kids up, get them dressed, get them out the door, and he never helps. And he's like, but I'm going to mass. I'm like, but your wife needs help. Yeah. And so again, as you said, not to confuse those two, this is our vocation and the things we do within the context of our domestic church mm-hmm. is how we sanctify each other in a, in a vocation. So good. Absolutely. Be- before we land, I'm going to throw you one hardball and I promise you we're done. <laughs> <laughs> but given everything that's played out in the last few years, um, the Lord is triumphant. He is overall. It isn't about conservative and liberal. It's about orthodoxy, truth lived out fully, God making us for himself. And I see in you a powerful proclamation that the problem is not one with skin. It's one with sin. Mm -hmm. And I see a unity of a couple who others may look through a certain very limited weaponized lens and, uh, and not understand it, but I'm sure you have unique insights as Catholic faithful believers at the cornerstone of civilization, declaring family and marriage as the cornerstone of civilization. I'm just giving you an opportunity if you want to take it as a man of color and a woman. I hate those stupid terms, but you know what I'm saying? What insights are key insights that you as a couple looking at the world now from a Catholic family perspective, you might bless us with? And you can punt if you want. When he first met me, I was really tan. He thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said this dark brown blonde. Um, I'm, I'm just going to be very honest with you. That's why I say the spirit of the world. Because there was times when all this stuff was at its height. And I'm, I just, the Black Lives Matter and the, the dis, d- division of the world and everything, the, the cities blowing up and people. I literally in my own home was like wanting to wear a t-shirt and say, Greg, I'm not prejudiced. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy because it was this heaviness this mm-hmm. i mean it was it's sick it's sick what we're dealing with in our culture and i'll tell you what it's it's my parents i mean they taught me so amazing we were in college and i remember writing my dad a letter and asking him 
um, you know, are you guys okay that Greg is black? And he wrote me this letter that I have to this day. It's yellow. He wrote it on a white piece of paper. It's yellow. And he said, I don't care what color you are. It's how you love each other. And it's one of these Catholic. (laughs) 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 But but we didn't even know that then, but all I can tell you is, yeah. And our our kids, I mean, I'll just say it just so they, they just, they, they are a huge reflection of both of us together. And literally we, we get more comments of complimentary than anything else. Um, yeah. What would you say? Well, yeah, I was going to dovetail that comment, especially talking with your parents, because they said it succinctly. The first summer I went to visit Julie, uh, her parents picked me up at the airport and there was kind of this awkward silence as we were walking to the car. And so her mom stopped. She's OK, we're going to deal with this right now. She said, look, I don't care what color you are. She said, the only thing I care about is that you love my daughter, treat her right and make her happy. And she said, clearly, you have been able to do so. Mm-hmm. And she says, so if there's anyone ever in my home that thinks otherwise, I'll ask them to leave because you will always be welcome Mm -hmm. and that that was our first meeting and and but it was that love that they had extended to me and i want to say and i think there's an old lattice somewhere where they say love has no color and if we bring the love in our lives and our relationship and let that be exemplified uh you're going to always have the naysayers but our love always went went out Uh, I'll, i'll go as far as to say this because when people look at us they think that my parents would have been the ones that had the problems or issues, but uh, her parents would be the ones with the problems and issues with me being black, but actually it was my mom, who long story short, thought that I was going out against my race for whatever reason. And I had to share with my mom, I said, look, I said, when I fell in love with Julie, it had nothing to do with her being white. I said, in fact, it was six months before I really looked down at our hands walking across campus one day where it really dawned on me that she was actually white. <laughs> I said, so my love for her has nothing to do with color. It's because of the woman that she is. And and my mom took a couple of years, but she really came to see that. They're, they're best friends. You can't tell them She likes part. me more than she likes him now. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that's funny is I'll tell you a truth, a true story. When we were first on EW10, we were on Life on the Rock and a caller called in and they said, how do you guys do this being in a mixed marriage i'm like oh we're both catholic because <laughs> i didn't know anything this that's great that's great like, oh my gosh they're so dumb but it was literally what i didn't understand what they meant i was like oh we're both catholic we're not mixed marriage and i was like oh hello so yeah but again i'll let them do this there's been nothing but but uh compliments and and athletic um applause for our, our relationship and, yeah. and people always come up and, and in fact we've never had any negative comment uh maybe because i'm six seven two hundred fifty five pounds but <laughs> it could, could have something to do with it but, but yeah mm-hmm. it, it has just been a pleasant experience and and we take that seriously because of the the stereotypes and things that are out there we are our extra uh, conscience of really presenting ourselves in a good way so that people can see that beauty. And oh, of course, you see our beautiful kids, which is why we have so many because I, I can't stop creating <laughs> beautiful kids. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah just, just, just teasing. But, but yeah, it's, so it's, it's been all beautiful. Well, we join the applause of others yeah. in Thanksgiving for your relationship, your marriage, your ministry, and for you being with us tonight. So we're honored and blessed by you and kindred and mission. And yes, we meet at last. It's blessed to be here with a number of friends and we continue to pray for you. We will link all of this to uh, the notes and I will connect with you after all this tomorrow, the next couple of days as we produce this and uh, have it in the series. But Alexander's, thank you so much. And to you, our beloved you. sojourners and faith. Well, oh, you want to say one thing, go ahead. I'm not going to argue with a six foot seven guy, even on the other side of a screen. <laughs> well, I just have one question. You're asking the one question. I want to ask the couples that are still on, how many of you guys currently pray together as a couple? Mm-hmm. I can't see the rest of them, so I'll I'll just take it that you all do. And uh, if you do, keep doing what you're doing. If you're not, I want to give you a model to start. If you do, I want you to add this to the mix. Every night before you retire, and retire can be any time after dinner up until the very moment you lay your heads on the pillow. I want you to come together, physically hold hands with one hand. If you have a small crucifix or rosary, feel free to place it in the other hand. Husband starts with our father, wife responds to Hail Mary, and then take turns noting a thanksgiving or intention to God for the other person. And this does two things. One of the areas that many couples fall 
uh, into is when one of the others made to feel as if he or she, he or she is being taken for granted in a relationship mm -hmm. that I'm doing all of these things and she never knows, she never acknowledges this way of praying eliminates that. In addition to the fact where our father tells us where two or more are gathered in his name, there he is in their midst. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about allowing God to be a part. This is one of those practical ways where we can call God down from the heavens each and every day, each and every time we come together and pray. So I'll act as if I say it to our father, Julie said to Hail Mary, and I can come back and say something like, Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for the helpmate that you've given me in Julie. Father, as you know, we've been so crazy busy these last eight months purchasing the property, the painting, the renovations, the kids in school, and all of those things. But yet, Julie finds it in her heart to go home to make home a haven for me to relax in every evening. In addition to that, Father, her willingness to put aside her own emotional needs to minister to my need for affection. Father, I am grateful to you for having her in my life as my beautiful bride. And I ask you for many, many more years to have her right here by my side. Amen. And so you can only imagine day after day, week after week, hearing those words of affirmation, what it does to your heart. And, and unless you are emotionally stunted, it just compels you to want to reciprocate and to do for the other person. And so first of all, you have to become cognizant now what your spouse is doing for you in the course of that day so that you can have something to share with our Heavenly Father when you come together that night and close in prayer. Amen. Yes. Thank magnificent, Thank you. magnificent crescendo, punctuating mark. Awesome. Talk about March madness, March greatness, <laughs> April greatness, I guess. Anyways. All right. God bless you all until Thank next you week. Again. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you all so much. Thank you for all those examples. You're welcome. You're, You're welcome. welcome. God bless you.